Greetings. Well, let me kick off with the U.S. equity market since I keep getting inundated with one question 24-7, which is what it was exactly that I missed. Well, what I missed was a 1 in 10 event whereby the S&P 500 ripped nearly 30% over the past year in a year in which corporate earnings rose the grand total of 4%. We have a 1 in 10 event in the forward PE multiple expanding not one, not two, but three full points to 21. Once again, a move that has only happened in a 12-month span 10% of the time in the past. All the while, consensus estimates on 2024 EPS haven't budged in the past year. And what's interesting is that the analysts collectively see 11% earnings growth in 2024, another 15%, by the way, for next year. And that's even though the Fed's own cheery forecast is for 3.8% nominal GDP growth this year. So let's get this straight. 11% earnings growth is what's embedded in the stock market. And the Fed, who is always typically bullish, sees 3.8% nominal GDP growth. That just doesn't add up. Not only that, but when you consider what happened last year, look what happened last year. Last year, we had 6% nominal GDP growth, and that could only muster a 4% earnings trend. But for this year, an expected economic performance of about half of that is supposed to generate profit growth triple of what we saw in 2023. So I say, look, Ma, new math. So if I was skeptical a year ago, what can I say, except I am bound to be even more skeptical at the moment, especially with these nosebleed valuations. I don't ever chase manias. I don't ever chase market bubbles. You will never find me doing that. And just because the valuations aren't as extreme as 1999-2000, we are nonetheless in a market bubble today. And valuations are even more stretched than they were at the market peak back, to, back in October of 2007. So we could use that as a benchmark. You don't always have to look at 99-2000 at the dot-com mania. So what do we have? We have math that still doesn't work. Didn't work a month ago. Didn't work three months ago. I would say it barely even worked a year ago. When I talk about the math, what am I saying? I'm saying a 4.8% equity earnings yield, benchmarked against a 5.4% treasury bill yield, is not exactly the most alluring comparison I've seen in my investing life. And I suggest that we all should be looking at risk adjusted returns, not the illusion of gross returns with no view towards the risk of drawdowns and capital erosion. We always have to look at risk-adjusted returns. And right now, and for the past several months through this ripping rally, investors have been willing to pay to take on the incremental risk as opposed to getting paid or compensated for that incremental risk. And to this day, that just does not make sense to me. We have multiples that are supremely elevated. As I said before, we are in the top decile, and that is just simply too rich for yours truly. As I said in my letter last week, momentum-driven markets can be very powerful beasts over the near term. I've lived through countless of them. But the fundamentals always went out, and the starting point for the PE multiple always and everywhere acts as either a long-term tailwind when you're in the bottom 10%, and a headwind when they're in the top 10%, as is the case today. And that's the point I'm trying to make. So then all of this brings me to our just released strategizer publication, hot off the presses. The S&P 500 model, in the face of this ripping rally that's predicated on speculation and momentum, as opposed to earnings, uh, even though it's Broadened out of late, the model has moved to maximum bearer signal. The same bearer signal, by the way, that it was flashing back in January of 2022. 
Virtually every other market in the world, by way of contrast, is somewhere in the vicinity of neutral. Emerging Asia, giving its compelling valuation metrics, by far, by far has the highest scorecard. On fixed income, our bond duration model improved significantly this past month. It's at its best level since last October, which, by the way, presaged a very nice 100 basis point decline in the 10-year Tino yield over the ensuing two months. Our corporate credit spread model is far less inspiring for asset allocators, although they do possess a superior score relative to the U.S. equity market, but not to the treasury market. Commodity prices. Well, our resource model took a step back in the past month alongside the ever squishy soft global demand backdrop. The exception being gold. The gold strategizer scorecard popped up 20 points in the past month, and it's right on the border between strong neutral and a buy signal. On the FX market, the Japanese yen is by far the one with the most compelling valuation metrics. It looks like a spring coil, especially if the BOJ moves out of its negative interest rate policy within the next month or two. So to finish off, where to be invested? Emerging Asian equities, treasury bonds, gold, and the yen, and a move up in quality within the corporate credit space, because I also see problems looming in high yield and in the market for private debt. But what's very clear is that investors can put their money globally, based on our models, in areas that make sense. Once again, that includes primarily emerging Asian equities, U.S. government bonds, indeed, gold, and FX investors should be concentrating in the Japanese yen. Thank you very much.